हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम बैक टू दी आई आई टी पाल सीरीज ऑफ बायोलॉजी आई रिकीशा भौमिक पी जी टी बायोलॉजी ऑफ केंद्रीय विद्यालय सेक्टर टू आर के पुरम विल बी असिस्टिंग यू इन लर्निंग द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ एवोल्यूशनरी बायोलॉजी इन कंटिन्यूएशन ऑफ द प्रीवियस सेशन ऑफ एवोल्यूशन पार्ट वन वेयर वी डेल्ट विद द कॉन्सेप्ट एंड थ्योरी ऑफ ओरिजिन ऑफ लाइफ एंड लाइफ फॉर्म्स एंड एवोल्यूशन इन दिस सेशन वी विल फर्दर डेलीब्रेट अपॉन सम इंटरेस्टिंग कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ एवोल्यूशनरी बायोलॉजी वॉट यू विल लर्न टूडे थ्रू दिस लेक्चर इज अबाउट बायोलॉजिकल एवोल्यूशन एंड द थ्योरी ऑफ नेचुरल सिलेक्शन विच एक्सप्लेन्स इट वी विल ऑल्सो लुक फॉर द एविडेंसिस इन फेवर ऑफ एवोल्यूशन सो लेट एस बिगिन फर्स्ट बाय रिकैप्चुलेटिंग द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ बायोलॉजिकल एवोल्यूशन यू मस्ट रिमेंबर दैट चेंज इज द ओनली कॉन्स्टेंट इन दिस वर्ल्ड nothing is static nothing is stationary everything is changing the earth is changing and so is the life forms on it biological evolution refers to the change with modification it refers to descent with modification that means that all the living organisms are continuously changing and showing constant modification i repeat biological evolution refers to descent with modification or continuity of life with constant modification the theory of natural selection to explain this process of biological evolution was given by the great charles darwin i will like to mention here that charles darwin was a naturalist and he went on a sea voyage around the world and in this voyage which lasted for 5 years he explored many things he observed many new species many different kind of species and noted everything evolution by natural selection started when cellular forms with differences in metabolic capacity originated on earth obviously the evolution will start when different type of cellular forms are available which are showing different metabolic activities so what is natural selection to define it in concise terms we we can say that it is the process whereby organisms which are better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offsprings why are certain organisms better adapted because of the variations which are inheritable and provide survival advantage to the species now the question arises how does these variations occur yes you must have read that variations arises because of the process of sexual reproduction the sexual reproduction is the process which leads to genetic recombination and it produces variation and there are many other factors which may lead to variation for example prolonged exposure to ionizing radiations may cause certain kind of mutation leading to variations other atmospheric changes that produces changes either in genes or chromosomes or the germ plasm can be the cause of these variation so the theory of natural selection states that the organisms who are better adapted to their environment they will tend to survive because the nature will select them for their advantageous characteristics and these organisms will show fitness and this fitness refers to the ability to produce more offsprings and since they are in a better position to produce more offspring they will flourish and perpetuate these organisms are better adapted because they have certain variation or certain characteristics which can be inherited from one generation to the next generation and how does these variation occur these variation for now you can remember that these variation occur due to sexual reproduction or through ionizing radiations or through atmospheric changes so uh, after giving a brief idea about the natural selection what is natural selection we can now better understand the postulates which were given by charles darwin in his theory of natural selection so under this theory of natural selection there are four important things to be remembered 
what are those four things number 1 individuals in a population have variations which can be passed to the next generation that means that each population of individuals have variations in them they have inbuilt variations in them and these variations should be inheritable which can be passed to the next generation then there is struggle for existence the second main postulate is that since all the organisms have the capacity to reproduce at their maximum level but they are further controlled by the forces of environment that shows that there is some sort of struggle for existence operating among the organisms we know that the natural resources food shelter land they are in limited quantity and if the population keeps on increasing there will arise a competition between them this was the second postulate given by charles darwin thirdly survival of the fittest now we can relate point 1 and 2 by saying that some variations are helpful for the organisms and it will provide survival advantage to them so that they are in a better position to adapt with the environment or with the nature and the nature hence selects them so these organisms who are better adapted to the environment or in terms of reproductive fitness they are fit to reproduce and perpetuate their offsprings will be flourishing and then the fourth postulate is reproductive fitness which we have already discussed now we have to remember that more young ones are produced than can survive and it is true for all the organism for example you must have observed the eggs of mosquitoes in stagnant water you may have seen that these eggs are in large numbers hundred or thousands but all of them will not grow to become a mosquito because there are other forces operating in the nature which may eat them or which may destroy them so each organism has has this tendency to produce more young ones than that can survive but fitness is the end result of the ability to adapt and get selected by nature so the organism having variations those variations which are inherited and advantageous to them will be selected by nature and they will be in a better position to adapt to their condition and they will reproduce and increase their progeny so the, this is the crux of the theory of natural selection the key words or the value points to be remembered here are number 1 variations are present in each population these are inherited variations can be of different type but those variations which are beneficial and provide survival advantage to the organism will help in coping it with the changing environment with respect to the other individuals of the same population and this fitness which will be acquired as a result of its ability to adapt will determine the further course of action in the process of evolution so the theory of natural selection is one of the most defining theories of biology and it has been convincingly accepted by all the scientists all around the world so after discussing the theories for theory of natural selection after understanding what is the mechanism operating which is leading to evolution of life forms let me explain you uh, the process of natural selection through a diagram for example if we see biological evolution by natural selection so we will be trying to understand this concept with the help of an example suppose there is a culture of certain bacteria the bacteria has been put under a medium 
the population of bacteria may have two variants. I am showing these in blue color and the other variant in red color. Let the other variant be B and the first variant be A. In the given circumstances, in the given medium, we, we can see that there are more number of A's as compared to the B's. But if there is a change in the medium, change in the medium, if there is a change in the medium, it may happen that the microorganism, the B microorganism having different variant is better adapted to this medium and it will start reproducing leading to less number of A. Since A is now not in a better position to adapt in the second medium, now the B variant of the microorganism population will start flourishing. So, this is how the microorganism, this is how the change in medium has affected the population. Each population I said have certain variation and uh, variation or the variants. The variants which are favorable will be accepted by nature, will be selected by nature in the new circumstances. So, uh, I hope this uh, example is clear to you. And now, we will move further to evidences for evolution. Uh, evolution is evolution real? We are studying so much about evolution, but is evolution real? How do we know it? Obviously, we know something or we believe in something when we have evidence about it. Yes, evolution, the process of evolution has some evidences. We have these evidences from varied sources. The evidences of evolution has come from various sources such as paleontology, morphology and comparative anatomy, embryology, biochemistry, connecting links, missing links, direct observation of evolutionary processes and anthropogenic evolution. So, briefly if I describe them, paleontology is the study of fossils, morphology is the study of external features of organisms, comparative anatomy when we are comparing the internal structure of organisms, embryology deals with the developmental biology, the stages of development in the embryonic stages, biochemistry deals with the chemistry of life, the chemical reaction, the metabolic reactions which are taking place inside the body. Then we will learn about connecting links, missing links and how there are certain direct observation of evolutionary process. We will be seeing certain examples which give us the direct evidence of evolutionary processes. Then anthropogenic means those changes which have been brought about by man, man generated evolution. So, let us discuss these one by one. First of all, evidences from paleontology. Paleontology as I told you earlier refers to the study of fossils and what are fossils? Fossils are the remains or impressions of organisms that lived in past. So, we can get direct evidences of the organism which used to live in the past by examining the fossils. How do we examine the fossil? We can determine the age of fossils by radioactive carbon dating technique. In this, we use a radioactive carbon isotope carbon 14 and we determine the remaining life of carbon, remaining carbon present in the organisms. And the, by this technique, we can determine the age of fossils, how old it is. Then the other method is the cross section of earth's crust indicate arrangement of sediments one over the other. The rocks, the sedimentary rocks have been formed one by one and the geological time history shows the deposit, the deposition of these sediments one over the other. 
So, the fossils which are found on a particular sedimentary layer can be ascribed to that particular geological time period. Different aged rock sediments, they contain fossils of different life forms. So, what is the geological time scale? Geological refers to the history of earth and the history of earth has been divided into five eras and these five eras have been further divided into periods and periods into epochs. Now, the eras are five starting from the very beginning when there was uh, the just the origin of life Archeozoic, then Proterozoic, Paleozoic, Mesozoic and Cenozoic. These are the five eras. Archeozoic era, we do not find any fossils because all the organisms which were there were soft bodied and hence we do not found any we do not find any fossils for them. Proterozoic era uh, had dominant species as sponges and cylindrates. In the Paleozoic era, we found the fossils of invertebrates, Mesozoic was dominated by reptiles and dinosaurs and Cenozoic which is the prevailing era is dominated by mammals. So, you can see that fossils are the remains or the impressions of organisms which used to live in the past and by examining them, by knowing their age, we can find out that when these organisms were present in the geological time scale of earth. These are the pictures of some fossils, dinosaurs and a fish on the sedimentary rock. So, these are what fossils look like. Now, coming to the next evidence from the source morphology and anatomy. Here we will be discussing about homologous organs. What are homologous organs? Homologous organs are those organs which have common origin and built on same fundamental pattern, but they perform different functions and have different appearance. Uh, for example, you can see this figure where the four limb of man, cheetah, whale and bat has been shown. You can see that the origin and the basic fundamental pattern in all of them remains the same, but the fore limb has been modified to perform different function according to their habit. Man performs the function of grasping with the help of his hand, cheetah, cheetah uh, uses his fore limb to run and veil for swimming, bat for flying, but the structure remains the same. The long bone is the humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals all are present in them. Similarly, another example is the structure of brain which is similar from fishes to mammals. The vertebrate, the vertebratas, they show similarity in many organs, the brain, uh, the heart and many other organs they show similarity. What does this suggest? The homologous organs suggest evolutionary relatedness or they give the evidence that these organisms had a common ancestor. So, apart from remembering what are homologous organs, you should also remember what is the significance of homologous organ. The significance lies in the fact that these organisms who show homologous organs have a common ancestor and they are more related to each other. Coming next to analogous organs which are just the opposite of homologous organs. In this diagram you can see insect wings and bird wings. Insect wings and bird wings both of them are used for flying. A bird also uses its wing for flying and the insect also. But here the origin and the structure are different. The wing of an insect is the modification of its integument, whereas in the birds you can see that there are again those bone structure, humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals and has been modified into feathers. So, we see that the origin and pattern of arrangement is different in these orga organs, but they are performing similar function because of their common habitat. 
Similarly, you can see here the pectoral fin and the flipper. Flipper is again the modification of the forelimb in the dolphins. The dolphin is a mammal and shark is a fish, but because they are unified by a common habitat, they are showing similar function although they have a different origin and different pattern of arrangement. So, we can define analogous organs as the organs having similar functions and appearance, but totally different in their basic structure and developmental origin. So, what does this suggest? Obviously, you are right in thinking that the analogous organs suggest that the organisms are distantly related in the terms of evolution and they do not bear a common ancestor. For example, one more example has, has been mentioned here, stem tendril of passiflora and leaf tendril of P. You can uh, think that the tendril has come from stem, the origin has been mentioned here, stem tendril, passiflora has tendril which has emerged from the stem and P has a tendril which has modified from the leaf. The origin are different, but the function is same. In both of the plant, the tendrils are helping in climbing. Similarly, potato and sweet potato both are found under the ground, but one is stem and the other is a root. Potato is a stem and sweet potato is a root and they both have been modified for the purpose of storing the food. So, analogous organs show superficial similarity between completely unrelated organism. So, through the help of uh, homologous organs and analogous organs, we can decide evolutionary relatedness of the organism. Those organisms which are showing homologous organs are more related to each other as compared to those who are showing analogous organs. Now, the next topic is divergent evolution. Divergent evolution is also known as adaptive radiation. In the previous session, I told you that I will be discussing about Charles Darwin and what did he observe when he went to his sea voyage. Yes, adaptive radiation is a phenomena which he observed and he gave the term adaptive radiation. Charles Darwin went on a sea voyage in a ship called HMS Beagle and he explored many different islands. One of the islands was the Galapagos Island which made him very curious because this island was geographically isolated from other regions and it was like a living laboratory of different forms of evolution. He observed many different types of creatures here. For example, he saw very large tortoises and he saw finches. Finches are specific type of birds, but these birds had evolved on the same place and acquired different kind of beaks. So, through these observations, he came to the conclusion that evolution is a gradual process and the process which is responsible for evolution is natural selection. So, let us now come back to the adaptive radiation and try to define what is it. The process of evolution of different species in a given geographical area starting from a point and literally radiating to other areas of geography. That means, adaptive radiation is a process in which the different species are evolving from a particular area and then they are radiating to other areas of geography. They are radiating or they are moving to other areas of the geography. So, what is the significance of adaptive radiation? Because they are originating from the same point, this establishes that they have a common ancestor and if they were having a common ancestor, they will have some common origins also. So, they show homologous structure adaptive radiation, divergent evolution, they are showing homologous structure. All these terms are connected to each other. It provides strong evidence in favor of organic evolution. The process of adaptive radiation in which the organisms are 
uh, evolving from a particular area from a particular point and then diverging into different areas this shows that organic evolution is taking place. Again the limb structure in mammals are the example of divergent evolution. In this picture you can see the pentadictyle limb, pentadictyle means we have 5 digits. So, this pentadictyle limb as the ancestral terrestrial vertebrate limb plan, it subsequently got adapted by modification for different users so that it may help them in different habitats. Uh, the basic plan has been shown uh, the hind limb, the femur, the longest bone, then tibia, fibula, lower leg, there are tarsals which are the ankle bones, metatarsals and phalanges. In monkey, these are the different mammals and all of them possess this pattern of arrangement of the hind limbs, but all of them have been modified according to their respective habitats. For example, in monkey, this type of arrangement is present, but it is modified for grasping, in pig for walking, in horse for running, in mole for digging and in moles uh, we can see a reduced kind of displaced carpal is there and it is it has been further reduced and modified. Then ant eater shows tearing kind of habit, then dolphin shows swimming, dolphin is a mammal and it lives in water and it need to swim there. So, the, four, the hind limbs have been modified. Similarly, in bats it has been modified for flying. So, this is showing you the concept of adaptive radiation, how the common structures, how uh, an organism from a single point it started evolving and then they diversified into different habits. Another example is the Darwin's finches. As I said that Charles Darwin observed many finches, there were many different species of finches, different types of finches. Finches are small birds uh, which had peculiar beak, but he saw that all the finches, there were many different kind of finches and they were showing different kinds of beak adapted for their feeding habit. Some were showing fruit habits, some were showing leaf habit for eating the leaves, some for insect. So, there were different kind of finches with different feeding habits and all had arise from a common ancestor which was seed eating. And the similar seed eating finches were present in other areas also. But what was special about Galapagos Island was that uh, apart from the seed eating finches, other kind of finches were also there. Then the third example is the marsupials of Australia. Again Australia is an island which is separated from the uh, rest of the world and the marsupial radiation has been shown here. The marsupial kind of habit, the marsupial kind of feature has been uh, has ar arose from a common ancestor and have radiated into different habits. This Manian wolf, tiger, cat, ant eater, rat, kangaroo all of them are, are uh, have been diversified from a common ancestor. The next we come to convergent evolution. Just like we studied homologous organ, analogous organ and they were opposite of each other. Similarly, the, the concept of divergent evolution is exactly opposite to that of convergent evolution. Diverge means to spread and converge means to come at a point together. So, uh, with this basic idea, I would like to define it for you. Convergent evolution is the process where organisms who are not closely related independently evolve similar traits as a result of having to adapt to similar environments. So, they are not related at all, they are evolving independently, but they evolve similar traits because of the unifying environment they are present in. Since they have to live in the same environment, they all are adapting themselves to show similar feature. So, a superficial similarity is seen among them, but in the origin and in the arrangement they are different. 
when more than one adaptive radiation occur in an isolated geographical area it is called convergent evolution or adaptive convergence so when more than one adaptive radiations is occurring in some area which is isolated then the process of convergent evolution will take place and it is also known as adaptive convergence and it will lead to analogy divergent evolution leads to homology and convergent evolution leads to analogy it is also known as parallel evolution because the adaptive features they are showing similar because of the same habitat this these are the examples convergent evolution showing the examples placental mammals and the similar australian marsupials are also present anteater in the placental mammals and the numbat anteater again this is an example of convergent evolution jurassic ichthyosaur which was a marine reptile and the modern dolphin which is a mammal they both have the common habitat they live in water but they have adapted themselves for the water like adaptation water like habit both of them have streamlined muscular body dorsal fin to cut through water they have propulsive tail and they have a keen eyesight but we know that both of them are very much different from each other one is a reptile and the other is a mammal similarly the shark and uh, dolphin is also the example of convergent evolution because shark uh, is a fish and dolphin is a mammal so let us see the process by which two lines of evolutionary development bring about superficially similar creatures when different groups of organisms are subjected to the same environmental selection pressures they tend to evolve similar design features so it is the impact of environmental forces on them which is making them to adapt to the environmental conditions so till now we we have discussed about the evidences of evolution we were at the first we discussed paleontology the evidences which are coming from the study of fossils then we studied about the morphology and comparative ana anatomy morphologically similar characters analogous organs and internally similar characters but superficially they appear different are the homologous organ so this is about the morphology and comparative anatomy so you have to remember these points when you write an answer on evidences of evolution then vestigial organs also give you some idea of evolution what are vestigial organs vestigial organs are useless remnants of structures or organs which might have been large and functional in the ancestors but in due course of evolution since they are no more used they have reduced in size for example nictitating membrane at the eyelids of the eyes then uh, the pinna it has reduced the muscles which were used to move ears we are not able to move our ears there are certain mammals which can do them hair on the body and the third molar pointed canine which was suitable when we fed on uh, raw vegetables raw roots or raw flesh then vermifor ap appendix which is present in ruminants is not present is uh, is not present or reduced in humans so these are the examples of vestigial organs vestigial organs are those structures or remnants of those structures which used to be large and functional in our ancestors but now they are no more used so they have become vestigial or rudimentary now the next evidence which comes is from embryology what is embryology embryology is the study of the developmental stages of embryo here you can see the picture of different vertebrates uh, man pig reptile bird and you can see that the embryos look alike they have a similarity between them the the similarity also suggests that they had a common ancestor and they are much more related evolutionarily so the study of embryos 
and their structure can also give you an idea of the evolution process. Then there are evidences from biochemistry, biochemistry deals with the biochemical reactions which are operating inside and the biomolecules. Here you can see the DNA fingerprints of different uh, different mammals, human, chimp, gorilla, orangutan and you can see that we resemble the chimpanzees very much. And this shows that we uh, have a common ancestor. Remarkable similarity in biochemical processes, enzymes, hormones, bloods and proteins also suggest that the process of evolution is taking place. The similarity in proteins and genes, this also suggests that we have come from a common ancestor and the process of evolution is occurring. Now the next evidence which come is from connecting links. What are connecting links? Animals which exhibit characteristics of more than one group are called connecting links. Those animals which are connecting one group to the other and they are exhibiting the characteristics of both the groups are known as connecting links. Example viruses as you all know that virus is a connecting link between living and non-living. When it is outside the body it remains as a crystal and it needs a host for showing lifelike characteristics. Euglena which is a connecting link between plants and animals. Balenoglossus is a connecting link between non-chordates and chordates. Balenoglossus comes under hemichordate and it is like a connecting link between the chordates and non-chordates. So, there are certain organisms which act as connecting link between two groups and again this gives you an idea, this gives you an evidence of evolution process taking place in nature. Here you can see peripatus, it is a connecting link between annelida and arthropoda. So, it shows both the characteristic, it shows the segmentation like annelida and it is also showing appendixes as present in arthropoda. Then missing links, what are missing links? Just like connecting links, these are also showing characteristic of two different groups of living animals, but these are in transitional fossil forms and we do not have any living organism acting as a link between two groups. You can see here the fossil Cimoria which is called a missing link between amphibian and reptile. And this is Archipetrix the missing link between reptiles and birds and uh, which is thought to uh, show both the characteristics of reptile and bird. It had wings to fly and it had a terrestrial habitat also just like reptiles. Now the next evidence which comes is from direct observation. Certain evolutionary processes are ongoing and we can directly observe them. For example, the artificial breeding program or the hybridization which the human is doing for a long time for his own benefit. Man has bred selected plants and animals for agriculture and horticulture, domestication of wild varieties has also been done and this intensive breeding program has created breeds that differ from other breeds but still are of the same group or species. The breeds are different forms of the same species. So many kind of different animals have been uh, created by this process. So the question which arises is if man in hundred of years could create new breeds, could not nature have done the same over millions of years? Yes, nature is a more stronger force and over millions of years this process is undergoing. So if within 100 of years we can directly observe the result of artificial breeding program and the creation of different breeds then obviously it is true that in nature also the process of evolution is taking place. Evolutionary change in beak shape of Darwin's finches have been observed. Again 
I would like to reiterate here that the Darwin's finches which we learned about Charles Darwin he observed certain small birds which were known as finches and having different beaks. The evolutionary change in them has also been observed by many scientists within a period of uh, like 2 years. Uh, this is the picture showing you different type of breeds, artificial breeding in dogs has been done and different breeds have been obtained. Now coming to the next example of direct observation which is a very good example, it is the it is known as industrial melanism. So, what is industrial melanism? Industrial refers to industrial revolution which came in England about 1900 and melanism means pigmentation, increasing of pigmentation. Now, how both of them are related? Let us see. Uh, the industrial melanism refers to the presence of moths, these moths uh, which are called bistin bitularia were of two types, one was the darker and the other one was lighter. Before industrialization in England, the white moths were abundant, but the dark ones were lesser in number. The phenomena which was observed was that immediately after industrial revolution, the number of dark colored moths increased and the number of white colored moths decreased. Can you suggest the reason why? Yes, you are good in thinking that the process of evolution occur by natural selection. So, this kind of evolution which has been generated by or created by man is known as anthropogenic evolution. Industrial revolution is a direct consequence of man's activity, man's interference with nature. Industrial melanism is one example of man-made or anthropogenic evolution. Before industrialization, more white winged moths were present and after industrialization, more dark winged moths were observed. What had happened? Before industrialization, actually the tree trunks were light and there was a thick growth of lichens over there, lichens are white in color and you must be knowing that lichens are very good pollution indicators. They will not grow in an area which is highly polluted. So, these lichens used to grow on the trunk and the tree trunks were also light and the white colored moths could easily camouflage and defend itself from its predator. But what happened after industrialization? You are right, the pollution level increased and these tree trunks have became darker in color because of the deposition of smoke and soot from industries. Lichens also started disappearing. This kind of changes in the environment led the dark colored moths to survive. The dark colored moths could now easily camouflage on these trunks, but the white colored moths could easily be spotted by their predators and thus the number of dark colored moths increased as compared to the white colored moths. And this process of melanization or this process, this directional evolution in favor of dark winged moths is known as industrial melanism. Then, other examples can also be thought of which are direct result of anthropogenic evolution. For example, you must have seen that nowadays the pesticides, insecticides or even the simple mosquito repellents which you use at home are of no use. Why? Can you think why? Yes, it is also a gradual process of change. The excess use of pesticides and insecticides has resulted in selection of resistant varieties in much lesser time. So, the resistant varieties they are being selected by nature since they are resistant they are not showing any effect of these pesticides or insecticide. Similar is the case of antibiotics or drugs which we are using for uh, treating our diseases. The disease resistant varieties are 
being selected by the nature and in many cases we can see that antibiotics are providing no effect on the organism. We can also initiate genetic changes in laboratory population of drosophila to study evolutionary changes. So, these are the direct observation of the process of evolution, industrial melanism, the resistant varieties being selected of the organisms or we can also artificially see the process of evolution in organisms which have a shorter life cycle. Now, let us discuss. So, we are now at the end of this session and in this session we discussed about the different sources of evidences in favor of evolution. The different sources of evidences for evolution comes from paleontology, the study of fossils, then morphology, anatomy, the presence of vestigial organs, divergent evolution, convergent evolution, they also give you a direct evidence of evolution, connecting links, missing links, direct observation of certain phenomena which has resulted into evolution. All these give you an idea that yes, evolution is real and it is occurring. Although at a slow pace, but steadily all the organisms are undergoing changes. This biological evolution is also known as descent with modification. That is continuity of life with modification which is constant. So, let us discuss. In the last session, I gave you certain questions to reflect over. I am sure you must have thought over it. So, let us now discuss them. Is it possible to have chemical evolution of life in the present conditions of earth? I gave you a brief idea about how life originated, what were the primitive condition on earth. So, is it possible to have chemical evolution? The answer is no. It is not possible to have chemical evolution of new living forms today because the environmental conditions prevalent then and now has undergone a sea change. The environment is not at all similar to what it was present then. The primitive earth had conditions suitable to initiate such a kind of chemical evolution of life as is evident from the Miller and Urey's experiment. Miller and Urey's experiment to remind you again, they did an experiment to show that under a laboratory scale molecules, biomolecules could be formed if the primitive earth like conditions are created. So, the answer is no, chemical evolution of life cannot take place in the present conditions of earth. Then the next question which I gave you was, do you agree that the rate of appearance of new forms is linked to the life cycle or lifespan of an organism and how? The answer is yes. How? We know that new forms arise out of the reproductive fitness gained from inherited advantageous variation. I am again saying that the new forms which are arising, they are arising out of the reproductive fitness. And how they are gaining this reproductive fitness? Because they have certain inherited variations, inherited traits which are provide, providing them with a survival advantage. This is the postulate of natural selection. And in due course of time, the variant population outgrows the other forming a new species altogether over a period of time and this is known as speciation. For example, the example I gave you about the population of a microorganism of a bacteria having two variants A and B, the B both of them A and B were growing in a medium, but when the medium was changed B the variant of the same population could better adapt to the new medium and over a period of time we will see that a new species can form out of that population. And this process of formation of a new species from the existing population is known as speciation. 
So, organisms having shorter lifespan will show new forms within day as in bacteria. We know that bacteria they multiplies very rapidly and for the same thing to happen in fishes or fowls would take millions of years as their lifespans are in years. So, we can say that yes, the rate of appearance of new forms is linked to the life cycle or lifespan of an organism. The mechanism of natural selection is operating in all the organism, but those organisms which are having a shorter lifespan will be able to show this mechanism more rapidly as compared to those organisms which are having a longer lifespan. The third question which I gave you was that nature selects for fitness which are inherited characteristic. The theory of natural selection says that nature will select those organisms which have certain characteristics which enable them to adapt to the nature. Can you suggest the means by which characters can be inherited? How these characters are inherited? When we talk about inheritance, we should not forget the contribution of Mendel. Gregor John Mendel who is known as father of classical genetics talked about inheritable factors affecting the phenotype uh, which unfortunately Darwin could not acknowledge. Although both of them were contemporary, but Mendel was unfortunate for he did he was not recognized for his work during his lifetime and Darwin either ignored or did not uh, take into account his revelations, his theory. So, uh, the natural uh, the fitness which is arising uh, are because of the inherited characteristics and what are those characteristics and how are they being inherited. Mm, they are being inherited by the process of uh, sexual reproduction, we know that variations are produced by sexual reproduction as I told you in the beginning because in sexual reproduction there is a genetic recombination of chromosomes and the variations are produced, but there can be sudden uh, alterations also which are known as mutation. Mutation was explained by Hugo D. Weiss, these are the large differences arising suddenly in a population. So, what are the sources of variation? Number 1, till now what we have discussed we can say that the one source is sexual reproduction, the genetic recombination and the other is mutation. There can be other factors also which we will discuss in the later sessions. The last question which I gave you was the differences between Darwin, Darwinian variation and Hugo D. Weiss's mutation. Differences between Darwinian variation, now we have come to this conclusion that the, uh, that the variations are causing evolution, are causing certain features and helping in natural selection, natural selection. So, there are two concepts, the Darwinian variation and Hugo D. Weiss's mutation theory. So, what is the difference between them? According to natural selection, the variations are small and directional, small they are taking place uh, very slowly, steadily and they are directional in favor of one variant, whereas mutations are random and directionless. Evolution is gradual, but mutation is a single step large mutation which is called saltation. Now, the last question was that is evolution a process or a product? Again, this is a very complicated question whether we call evolution a process or a product. Well, evolution can be called as a process by which all the inanimate and the animate matter has been created on earth. The all the biodiversity which has been created can be attributed to the process of constant evolution. So, in terms of this creation of biodiversity, we can connote evolution as a process, but at the same time evolution can also be said as a product or a result of process and what is that process? Natural selection, the organisms 
are having variations those variations which are well suited to the nature they are being selected and this is leading to evolution so in this case evolution becomes a product so when we describe how different life forms came into existence we are actually saying that evolution is a product so by this we can conclude that evolution is a process as well as a product it is a process by which the biodiversity has been created but it is a product which describe how different life forms came into existence our natural selection and evolution processes uh, end result of some unknown process is still not clear that means that it may be possible that the natural selection the process of natural selection and evolution may be the end result of some unknown process but it is still not clear and we are in a position we are at a stage where we should examine it further so till now we can say that evolution is a process as well as a product now in this session we have discussed many important concepts of evolution let us summarize what we have dealt with in this session today we learned about biological evolution by natural selection we saw in depth the postulates of natural selection what are the key points of natural selection which we should remember we also saw the evidences for evolution which come from a varied sources such as paleontology morphology and comparative anatomy embryology biochemistry molecular phylogeny connecting links missing links direct observation of evolutionary processes and also anthropogenic evolution we also discussed whether evolution is a process or a product we also differentiated between darwinian variation and hugo de vries's mutation so let's conclude and at the end i would like to give you some questions so that you reflect over and when we come back in the next session which will be the last series of this topic evolution you will be in a better position to understand the concept so the first question is explain antibiotic resistance observed in bacteria in light of darwinian selection theory the second question is find out from newspapers and popular science articles about any new fossil discoveries or controversies about evolution the third question attempt giving a clear definition of the term species and the fourth question is describe one example of adaptive radiations all these questions have been taken from your ncert exercise of the chapter evolution and these questions uh, have been given the selected questions which have been given for you to reflect is on the basis of the content which has been dealt today so with this i would like to conclude thank you